Welcome there. to Speed Bumps Live, everybody. Shannon, how are you doing? Excited to be uh, wrapping up today with a great guest. So, um, For anybody that is joining us for the first time, welcome to Speed Bumps Live. We are a bi-weekly, maybe soon to be once a month, a uh, web show that discusses marketing challenges and opportunities with leaders from different industries. My name is Paul Carpenter. And I'm Shannon Delaney. Awesome. And before we get started, I quickly want to mention that while we have the chat feature off, we're going to be doing Q&A towards the end of the show. Um, so please make sure you use the ask question or Q&A module there at the bottom of your screen. And we will get to as many of your questions as we can. And we have a guest moderator today. It is our very own Kayona Mead. Say hello, Kayona. Hey, everybody. Really excited. I have a kind of personal interest into this show, but you'll figure out a little later. Oh, yes. Yes. Go ahead and tell us who we've got today. Yeah. So today we have Jen Osborne, professor of digital and social marketing at the University of Georgia, near and dear to a lot of our hearts here in Atlanta. Uh, Jen is a full-time professor there. And she is running all things digital marketing, social media marketing strategy there at UGA. She's got over 20 years of experience in social media marketing, interactive marketing, and digital strategy, and brings that industry insight into the classroom. She founded the super cool agency Mega Player, um, that was a digital marketing and consulting and education company where she had her team partnered with established brands like Coca-Cola, Sunglass Cut, K-Swiss, Verizon, many, many more. Um, I got to cross paths with her uh, in my past working at agency together. And she was doing all things like developing strategy, content, social insights, research, analysis, all the good juicy stuff. And outside of teaching, Jen is the faculty sponsor for UGA's chapter of the American Marketing Association and the creator of the UGA Digital Marketing Competition, which is so cool and we'll talk about today. And she has a passion for teaching and helping the next generation of marketers transition into the working world. We've had the pleasure of working with her students, um, you and I both, Paul, I know, throughout her yes. programs in digital marketing and the competition in Atlanta and in our community. So we're really excited to have her with us and see what she's got going on uh, building the marketers for tomorrow. So thanks for joining us, Jen. Come on. It won't be awkward now that I'm gushing about you. Um, <laughs> kind of weird when somebody's doing that and you have to sit there and be like, how do I fix my face? Exactly. Um, <laughs> we're super excited you're here. Yeah, we're gonna very honored. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you a lot for of fun. Us. Yeah. So listen, let, we'll kick things off. And like we we typically do, uh, we like to take a few minutes and just kind of level set and kind of start a little bit of an origin story. We don't have to go that far back, um, but I do want to talk a little bit or have you tell um, our audience what led you to marketing, but more specifically, what led you to transition from all those uh, professional accomplishments to now what you're doing as a professor and preparing the students? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, well, I was I was born. No, <laughs> we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll fast forward a little bit. Um, <laughs> when I was in undergrad, I went to Florida State and I majored in marketing and fell in love. I became a marketing nerd. I couldn't get enough. I read everything I could. I tried to get as much experience as possible. Uh, and then um, out of school, I I started I thought if I could put technology and marketing together somehow, I, I would be in a good place. Uh, and so did that for pretty much my entire life. I wound up staying focused, uh, got my MBA, same thing as I was doing that, the internet came along. And so serendipity, it worked out, um, worked for a couple of different agencies, uh, over my time and was kind of putting a digital arm onto uh, oftentimes a traditional agency, trying to help them figure out how to blow out those offerings. And after a while, wound up uh, founding my own company. It's like, I've done this for two different companies. I need to do it for my own now. And so that's how Mega Player was born. Um, really had a good time with it. Uh, enjoyed, enjoyed all the clients, all the relationships. And because I've been in Atlanta for forever, I feel like I know a lot of people in the community. Um, 
at one point I was guest lecturing in a master's of internet technology program. And I swear, sorry, That's okay. uh, I swear what I was doing is a uh, kind of a capabilities presentation for my company, as well as a little bit of where I think the industry is going forward. Um, that led to a conversation with the marketing department head um, and, and they said, well, well, what's on your mind? And I said, well, I can't hire your students. And I wasn't talking about me specifically. I was talking about industry-wide 10 years ago. Um, marketing students were really, really great digital natives. They'd grown up with a phone in their hand. They, they understand how to be really good users, but they weren't really good at thinking about how to use digital channels as a marketer. Mm -hmm one thing led to another and i wound up creating a course uh, and i thought well this is great I'll, I'll recruit the best students off the top to come work for me in, in my organization um, and the rest can go to work for my competitors or my clients you know kind of the, the second tier um, wound up falling in love with it uh, falling in love with it so much so that i shut down my agency and wound up transitioning full-time into uh, this role uh, which I've been in uh, eight and a half years at this point. So it's been, wow. it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. It's been great. Nice. Well, that, I, I think that it. actually yeah. segues us over well, to so when we yeah. talked. Um, yeah, go for it. No, 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 no. This is on you, Shannon. Sorry. Okay. Well, so when we talked ahead of the show, one of my favorite things you said about um, your your philosophy for creating the program and um, you know what you hope to get out of it for your students. You talked about this idea of creating good experiences for the students, yeah. um, but also creating that curriculum that bridges that gap, as you just mentioned, that that kind of real world to classroom. And you know, a big part of that was the digital marketing competition. Can you talk about? Um, that and why you put it together and, and what's the benefit for everybody that's involved. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that I think it's important, if, 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 if any one of us who've been in marketing for any period of time, you know, we learn to think about, about a consumer experience, or we like to think about the journey and, and what all this is like. And so remembering that I did not grow up in academia and I don't speak pedagogy and all of these types of things, right? And I don't publish in journals that nobody reads and all of that, that type of academia is not really my strong suit. What I am good at is figuring out, well, who is my customer and what should that experience be for them so that I can deliver something of value. When I walked into the classroom the very first day, I looked at my students and, and if any of you are watching that were in that room, you know, I said, I don't have any idea how to be a college professor, but I do know what I need you to know. If you'll work with me, we're gonna get through it. And it's funny at the end of the semester, every semester we get feedback and we get evaluations and the students said, said you treat us like interns. You don't treat us like students. We are marketers. You make an assumption we're marketers. And because you make that assumption, we are marketers. For me, learning and the way that we learn, think about it as an industry, we learn from each other. We learn from case studies. We don't study academic theory and try to apply it to marketing. Um, we do at some level, right? But once you get those basic principles, the next thing we do is start thinking, well, where's the stratactical? right? Where's where the rubber meets the road? And that's what I try to bring into the classroom. When it came time to create this competition, um, there's some backstory, there's a little bureaucracy as to why it came to be. But, but in order for my program to be an actual program and not a class, right? Mm -hmm. There needed to be number one, more than one class. So we have a strategy class and we have an analytics class. We have an integrated class. So there's different classes that students have to take in order to get digital marketing on their diploma, not just marketing, okay? Beyond that, we needed them to have deep experiences. And so I'll talk about, um, we'll talk about uh, our conference and networking Spark South at some point, but also this digital marketing competition. What I needed that to be for the students was a mentoring program. Um, Students are encouraged all the time to get a mentor. The thing about it, though, is that 
it becomes a very awkward conversation. It feels like one of those things, oh, I got to make this phone call. I hope it only lasts 15 minutes. You know, you just kind of get through it. <laughs> and the mentor tends to put into it only what the protege or mentee would put into it. And, and, and so it becomes kind of flat. The thing with the digital marketing competition was we said, well, let's do a real world situation. And so we have gone out and accessed uh, relationships with Coca-Cola, with Carter's, with College Football Hall of Fame, with uh, Moe's, with Intercontinental Hotels Group and Hotel Indigo. Um, we've done Turner, lots of different brands around Atlanta, and we get a big project, something bigger than a student would do if they were just trying to make an A in a classroom, right? Because that you yeah. just kind of put in what you're willing to do to get the A. I wanted to challenge students to work far and above what they need to do to get an A. I want them to work at their level, whatever that can be, right? So that's their own kind of a thing. And putting them together with an industry veteran coach who can help them in teams provide an entire uh, pitch strategy campaign, have to meet budget, KPI, the entire thing, right? over a three or four month long process, with rounds of elimination and feedback, because that's an important part of it as well, allows the student and the mentor to join forces and look at a problem together. The student is also incented to show that coach their best work. That coach is incented to find the diamonds in the rough figure out how to help them transition from student into employment. So there's a lot of things that go into this competition. It's not just about let's check a box, make sure that we can get it on our degree. It's more of networking and mentoring in a way that feels very, very real. Mm -hmm. And the clients actually pay to be clients as a, as a component of this. And the reason why, well, the competition goes through rounds of elimination, very much like The Voice or Dancing with the Stars or any of those type of shows, right? You get feedback at the end of your kind of segment and then you move to the next round or you don't, right? So each coach, we draft it, go through a, a process and each coach is eliminating along the way till they get down to their very best team. And then there's seven, eight coaches sometimes that will then go and pitch or the students will come and pitch the client. The client is getting now eight agency level pitches with these students who have been coached up. I like to think of it, remember um, if you've ever taught a kid to ride a bike and you're holding on to the back of the bike and then once the kid's pedaling and then they let go and you, you just kind of, and the kid turns around and they're like, what am I doing? I'm doing You're it. You're doing it. That's well, right. that's the whole point is I want them to market like that, where it's, I don't want them to kind of think, oh, school is school and real work is real work. I want them to go, oh my gosh, I'm doing real work. And yeah. they do. And, and that, that confidence, they're off flying, they're off to the races. And yeah. Can you talk that's for a little of... bit about like the sheer number? Because I was really fascinated to learn at how big the top of the funnel started to yeah. how, I mean, it is, it is rigorous. Can yes. you just mention some broad numbers? Sure. sure. Yeah. So, so typically uh, we start with about 200 students every January. The competition's only offered once a year, spring semester. So in January we do a draft and uh, we have about 200 students that have registered. They get themselves into teams typically. Um, and then uh, it pair, it's teams of four or five students, right? Mm -hmm. And each coach, up to eight coaches, will have up to six teams. Right? So that's kind of how that math works. And then over the next couple of months, they'll narrow it down to where there's only one team per coach. And the longer you stay in the competition, the more mentoring you get, the deeper the relationships that you build. Oftentimes the final team gets paraded around to agencies and brands around Atlanta where they can practice pitch. Uh, many viewers may have actually been a part of that at some point uh, where you get to give feedback. And um, it's happened before one time there was a team that was pitching and there was a, a, a mid-sized agency uh, that they were pitching to not, it was just a practice pitch. And uh, one of the senior level people there looked and said, all right, which one of you doesn't have a job yet? 
and this one woman raised her hand and, and he said on the spot, if you want it, I'll hire you. She was just like jaw dropped, like, oh my goodness. Um, but if you can learn to think like that and present your ideas like that, you're going to be of value to me is what he said. So <laughs> that is incredible. Incredible. I hope, I hope people, yeah, it is. It is fun. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, be over there for this year's and just to be almost a fly on the wall and watch all this happen, even with COVID it was unbelievable and extremely inspiring. So thank you for what you do to this marketing community because you are fueling the future. And, and I'm not saying that, uh, you know, lightly. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, I want to segue over because I, I, and if you see me look away, it's because I'm jotting down notes and I'm, I'm really old and I can't remember. So I have to look. Um, you had mentioned something at the very beginning and it's the word community because I do truly feel like what you've created is a community. You are connecting coaches to corporations to students, and you are truly pulling in like all um, all threads to create this fabric. Right. And I would love to know like how you view community and how it teaches or how it um, how it impacts uh, what you're doing is impacting Atlanta's marketing community. Right, right. Well, I guess because I've always lived and worked in Atlanta, right? Um, I feel like, you know, the local group is my people, yeah. right? Um, but we also have many students that go to New York, many students that go to San Francisco, many students that go to Austin. And those networks have are natural parts of my network as they've always been um, just being a marketer. Um, but now those are growing as well. What the one thing that I've always felt regardless of whether when I was working on the brand side at UPS, whether I was working on the agency side um, for other people or for my own agency, there's a little bit of we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, a, you know, not every industry has the whole work hard, play hard with your friends kind of, kind of vibe, but Atlanta marketing for sure has that. And I felt that, you know, pretty much my whole adult life. And so, um, but, but there was a time, right, when I owned my agency where, where other agencies were competitors and clients were prospects or pr prospects could become clients, I guess is the way you'd say it. Uh, and, and so I thought about it, you know, kind of in a business perspective. And what I learned when I took this role, every single person that was a competitor or a prospect now wanted to be my friend and they wanted to find a way to give back to the students because think about the, the fabric of our community is all about learning from each other, growing with each other, giving back, remembering when we needed a leg up and who was there for us. And so all of a sudden it's like, well, this is absolutely the natural thing to do. For me also, when I think about it, um, you know, my students are going to come become colleagues Mm -hmm. right? They're going to, to move into that role. And so staying close to the community and asking, what do you wish you had in a new hire? What skills do you want them to have? Hard and soft, because I've been given a ridiculous amount of freedom to be able to bake into the curriculum, whatever we need. So it's kind of like, you know, I shop it every few years and I'm like, you know, here's kind of an outline of what I'm teaching. What do you think is missing? Mm. What needs to be added? And some of it somewhat tactical and somewhat a pretty, pretty strategic, but I like to, but I think of, I think of the hiring community. So whether it's brands or agencies, local or re, you know, different regions of the country, I, I like to think all of that is my customer. Mm -hmm. The students are my product right? And I'm all about helping those students become the best, you know, right? Getting them job ready is kind of, is kind of my, my shtick. That's, and that's so wonderful. making it, you know, kind of tailoring what they're coming in with is, is the way to go here. I think what's really special too about your program and having been a coach myself, mm -hmm. um, only was able to do it one year, but I'm looking forward to doing it again, because I have to say hands down, it was one of the most rewarding experiences I've had in my entire career. Like yeah. 
to be able to mentor people at that level in a real world situation. But I got so much out of it too, yes. because I saw, you know, when you do this for a while, you kind of start to think about approaching things the same way. Mm -hmm. And what you see from them is different ways of thinking about solving maybe some of the same old problems. And I really got a lot out of that. That was just, you know, I remember uh, we were in the Mo's year, we were pitching mm -hmm. Mo's and we had so much fun. We, we did we did primary research with customers. We did ethnographies at the store with employees. We wrote a jingle. We had a theme song. You know, there was this, so much cool creative stuff going on. And honestly, some of the creativity I experienced was even better than some of what I experienced working in some great agencies, right? Um, right. It's amazing what you can do when you can go off the rails, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I got so much out of it, really and truly. And I hired some of those students myself. Yes. I hired some of my own students. But just like you said, I was so committed to this broad swath of, you know, I think I had at one point, I might've started with somewhere around 30 students that I was mentoring. Yeah. Helped so many of them get a job and felt so proud of, you know, what I was doing and, and helping and knowing that I was sending great people. So mm -hmm. tell me about interning and tell me about what you think companies should be doing right now with not only like how to set up their program, but how they need to think about their interns and how they yeah. need to leverage them. Yeah, I would yeah. really love to hear that and how they benefit the companies and the, and the growth. Right, right, right. Well, from your experience, the one thing that I think you can take away is imagine what those students were giving to you and work, how they were trying to show you their best work. They weren't even getting a grade. Yeah. Right. So realizing that this whole work beyond the grade and work to your own self, you know, achieve your own levels of potential and, and all of those things, that's huge with this. And mm -hmm. interns will do the same thing for you. Um, when you think about an internship program, there's a few technical things that you should think about. In order for the student to get credit for the internship, you have to have 200 hours of work. So it's not right. Oftentimes, and, and, and I was always in this situation as well. God, I wish I just had a really smart college student who could come in and do X and it's a pretty tightly scoped project, right? Mm -hmm. And students are around for that all the time. And if you've got those kinds of projects and you wish, you know, obviously reach out, you need to plan to pay them, but let's don't call it an internship if it's a very fixed task, right? An internship program should be kind of a try it before you buy it situation where you want to actually interview the way that you would for a junior level associate, right? Bring them in, have them meet with different people or do it online, however you're doing it these days. But make sure that they're a culture fit, make sure that their goals and aspirations are in alignment with your needs and all of those kinds of, it's a real job, right? Although it's temporary, you need to think of it that way. The other thing that you need to think about it as you are providing the student with a survey of what your company does, how it operates. Remember, they can understand principles. They can even learn to write uh, campaigns. They can learn to calculate return on ad spend. They can do all kinds of things in a classroom. But what they can't do is understand culture, mm -hmm. right? So when you create an internship program, it's best if you can have it coincide with, um, with a school calendar. So have it start midway, early June, have it end in early August. Um, like that, that's a really good time. If you want to have them in the fall, realize that you're having students take, you know, what they would normally be taking 15 or 16 hours. And if you're going to have them come work for you, you're going to pay them for that time, especially if they're not living in Athens and working, you know, remotely. So obviously think about your situation. They don't have to hire my bulldog interns, but they are the best ones. <laughs> but think about that. Think about what it is that you're trying to understand for them to learn, right? What do you need them to do? What skills do you need them to have? But also what can you expose them to? And a lot of times you would just buddy them with a mentor in a specific department for maybe a week or two and have them kind of come on, go to this meeting with me, jump on this call with me. Let's go to lunch. Let's figure this out. Here's a task you're working on. And it's really good if you can have them work on a project that would maybe last the whole summer where they can present at the end what they learned, what they did, how they approached it. 
you should get some benefit out of these things, but it's not 100% what you as an employer can get. It's also what can you give to that student. And it's really important that you keep those things in check. Um, and and it, it winds up, if you can do it in the right way, it winds up becoming literally a trial before hire situation. Yeah. Oftentimes you wanna bring those people back. Well, if you do it right, you bring them on to help you start a really successful web show <laughs> and just have them do all of your promotion and marketing, right, Paul? <laughs> spoiler yes. alert, right? Like, yeah, so, so Kayona, here's a spoiler alert. Kayona is one of Jen's students, right? You're a Jen student. And we have Sophia on our team who's one of Glenn Caruso's students. So we love your bulldog interns um, so much that we'll hire them too. So, okay. So I have a controversial question for you. This is okay. um, one that, you know, because we just talked about interns and, you know, how do you uh, try it before you buy it? What is your take on this trend of giving people assignments uh, as part of the hiring process? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is there a time and a place? Thoughts on that? I do think there's a time and a place for it. Um, if you're hiring uh, someone to do perform a specific task, and, and it's more of that tactical execution, uh, media buying on Facebook, right? something like that. You need to know that they can do, it's easy to put it on your resume. It's another thing to, to know, can I trust this person to spend this money in the right way? And do they have the analytical skills to understand the, the reporting on the other side of it to figure out what's working and right. I always come down to analytics is this, it's either working or it's not, <laughs> do more of what's working and stop doing the things that aren't. Do they have the analytical skills to figure that out? I think an assignment is appropriate if you have a specific question like that, like demonstrate you can do these things. Um, I think that giving them an assignment to figure out how they think that's something that I, I, first of all, I give them assignments like that in class. So they should be able to show you how they think far beyond their resume, just from projects that they have from school. Um, but if you still need more, it shouldn't take long. And whatever it is, you shouldn't be selling whatever their answer is, oh. right? Don't, don't use them as a think tank and then turn around and throw it in your pitch. That's, that's not okay, right? right. Um, but but I, I think there's a time and a place. Oftentimes, students will come to me and say, hey, so-and-so, uh, I'm interviewing with them. I made it to the next round. They've given me this assignment. And I'll look at the assignment. And sometimes I'm like, this is way too much. Mm -hmm. And other times I'm like, I can see what they're getting at. And I think it's valid. Um, I think for me, and it's, it's that nuance, figure out why you're giving the assignment, right? Don't give an assignment just to see if they want the job. That, that's not valid right don't don't see who's going to put the most great effort advice. into trying yeah, like yeah that, that's, that's a great dumb. that's great advice yeah yeah, yeah. but if, if you really are if you if you can keep up with why you're trying and be true to it i think you'll be in a good place it's okay it's okay to give an assignment sometimes students panic just at the idea of an assignment or so they'll come to me and they're like oh my gosh i got this i got i got an assignment from so-and-so company what do i do what do i do <laughs> And I say, well, did you read the assignment? Yeah. They want me to do this, this, this. And I said, and I know you know how to do those things. And they're like, yeah, I'm just panicked. And I said, okay, <laughs> go for a run, come back and do the assignment. <laughs> Sometimes they, they, they panic and it's really, really cute, but it's because it's their first time and they're super excited about it, which I think is just awesome. Uh, but again, you want to be sure that you're not Again, you're, is you're that what you tell them? Uh, that's how you're going to feel every time you start a new job. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that feeling never goes away. Exactly. Right? No. Exactly. No. Um, real quick, I want to segue over to uh, to something at, because you said this is you've been doing it for about eight and a half years, right? And this was your eighth. This past one was your eighth digital marketing competition. Yes. Digital marketing has changed a lot in eight years. It has. So I am sure students have also changed over the past eight years. Yeah. Um, you, you're probably you're probably going from the the tail end of the millennial to the the birth of Gen Zs, and you've 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 bridged that 
or you've created a conduit between that. I'd love to know what your students look like back then mm -hmm. and what the current wave is looking like. What, what are they bringing to the table? What's that enthusiasm look like? What did it look like back then? I'm yeah. really curious to see how, and then also, are there any kind of really fun success stories out of this over the past eight years that come to mind? So yeah. loaded question, but I sure, think sure, sure, sure. Well, first of all, here's just to level set. You realize that today's college juniors and seniors were born in the year 2000. <laughs> so just, I know, everybody, ah, yeah, right? So just realize <laughs> we're dealing with a group of people that cannot even imagine a world pre-internet. Right. Yep. So the way that they think, everything, everything has been has been wired towards this. Uh, when I first started teaching, um, it was January of 2013. Many brands um, would basically, you know, hire the CEO's nephew to come in and give them keys to all the social channels and have them create content and didn't want to even really pay or whatever. That was the situation. And students, my first semester, were taking. Um, the course because they thought, oh, this will be kind of interesting. Let's go see what this is all about. We then evolved to social. That's easy. I can do that. It's an easy A. And they thought of it that way. Then they got in the class and they went, oh, wait, this is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. Um, I've evolved from just teaching social to digital. It's another thing you free, you have to evolve with the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and students now come in with a sophistication that they just simply didn't have before. But think about it. We as an industry have matured. We have grown in our level of sophistication and what we're looking for and what we're trying to do across digital platforms. Students are coming in with an understanding that this isn't some bright, shiny object. It's going to be a fun toy. It's, it's serious business. And so I'm seeing that they've evolved as we've evolved. Um, and they're ready to work. They get it. They understand they're choosing a professional direction for their career. And they're taking it seriously as is appropriate. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And then when we talked... Uh -huh. There was a really interesting story about one particular student and, <laughs> and a program or a campaign that they came up with. Yeah, so I, I, I'll tell you, in, in one of my classes, I give students, I, I like to give a large project in, in, in anything that I teach. I think that anybody, these students are professional test takers. And so like figuring out, you know, your ability to, to, to bubble a Scantron or, or take an online exam doesn't measure anything. It's can you synthesize the concepts and apply them to a situation. So I always give a large project, which again becomes those portfolio pieces to show off in interviews. Always a purpose. Um, and in this one, I get this, I let the students choose their brand. I give them a budget of $115,000 media buy, and then they have up to 90 grand to create content so they can do a lot with that. Uh, and, and I tell them, I said, don't pick some small brand that can't afford that. You need to pick you know, pick a brand that's of size to where a couple of hundred thousand dollar campaign is something they would do. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you get to choose what you're going to, you know, what kind of what you're going to do. And, and this one kid came to me with, uh, he wanted to rebrand uh, Chuck E. Cheese as the Divorce Dads Club. <laughs> it's funny every time. Perfect. <laughs> Never gets old. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But but lots of students come with really, re and I don't grade them on their creativity. I grade them on do their do their tactics align with their goals, and can they prove the measurement that are they measuring the right things? And I, I'm grading them on a, on all of that. But when they come with a really great creative idea, it's, it's funny. I'm just like, oh, this totally should happen. Of course it should. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, yeah. I was saying, um, I was saying to Paul when we were, you know, talking about having you on, I said, you know, Jen's got to have one of the toughest jobs as a professor, because if you're teaching American history, you just set your curriculum and your goal. Like you just do that forever. Right. Yeah. But here you are in a, in an environment where you're constantly having to change up that curriculum. You can never just rest on your laurels. So I'm really curious about what you're focused on right now 
and in the near future as a marketer um, that maybe others should be thinking about? Right. Well, so I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I'll tell you what's on my mind. I don't, <laughs> okay, I don't really I haven't quite it. <laughs> sold it yet. Um, so in my analytics class, uh, in one semester, students become Google Analytics certified. They become a uh, search certified. They get prepared. I don't force them to take it, but they pr get prepared to do Facebook uh, blueprint media planning. And also, um, and also they experience uh, Salesforce and I get them to, to get in some trailhead. Smart. So and then smart. they create a... Yeah. Yeah, and then, then what they'll do is they'll create a project that is a multi-campaign uh, a, a multi that would use all of those things, right? right? And so they have to pull it all together and, and synthesize everything that they learned, not just the, not just the certifications, but, but how do you use all of that towards some end for a brand? So, so that's what, what they're doing. And I tell them right now, I, I, I said, guys, if you can't be a marketer in today's world, given how much access to data that we have that we honestly should not have, Right. My personal opinion <laughs> is that as marketers, we are, are strict. We have the ability to be beyond creepy, beyond invasive, mm -hmm. beyond intrusive. And our, our, our game as marketers is to figure out how to be right up against that line without crossing it. Right. And we're always having to use some form of self-restraint because it's all legal. So, you know, um, <laughs> hit those numbers legal right. ethical it's right. a debate exactly <laughs> and, and and so I, I actually do have a whole talk on that about you know if you're selling shoes versus something somebody can't afford right you got to kind of think that through I, we we do an entire entire day on that um but as third-party cookies go away uh companies that have not collected their own data um and are having to rely you're going to have to become a better, more savvy marketer because you can't just go find, you know, people with green hair and blue eyes that wear only Nike. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't target at that level without that third party cookie. And so trying to figure out where we're going from that is going to be the next thing. Um, it, it gives students right now, I think they have confidence because I'm looking at them going, look, it's mm -hmm. never been easier to be a marketer than it is right now with all this data right? Very high efficiency, very little waste. That's probably going away. So it's good to graduate now and get in, <laughs> you know? build your reputation is good. And then you just adapt with the rest of us as we kind of move forward. That's, that's actually, kind of that's a really interesting way to think about that <laughs> truly. Cause a lot of the playbooks everybody's been running for so long are about to just go right out the window. Right. So it it's is, interesting. It is. Yeah. And so and so, you know, just as I think about building that community for, for my situation, I think companies are going to have to get back to those, those, those principles that we talked about early on in social, how do we build those tribes? How do we build those communities? Uh, and how do we nurture them along? Because right now, because the personalization that we can do that kind of, we don't really, we don't need to stay as true to that as maybe we once thought we did early on. So and we yeah. may circle back, who knows. That's great advice. And, and I, I definitely, uh, that's, that's, that's been on my mind and it's probably in about every uh, two to three newsletters that I get is everything about data and privacy and, yeah. and what people need to be doing going forward. So um, we're, we're sitting at, at 1240. I want to make sure we have time for questions and time to bring on one of your best students ever. Ever. <laughs> ever. So, ever. Kay, do you mind joining us? Make sure you come out. Yeah, look at that. See, I don't and even have to. I don't know us. about ever, but. <laughs> Listen. She's joining us from Athens, too. She's at home base. <laughs> That's right. That's Hold right. On. So um, real quick, Kay, I'm going to open the floor for you. First off, if you have any questions, but also if we have any questions from our audience. Of course, of course. Well, I will start with my own, of course, because I got the power, so why not use it, right? <laughs> <laughs> the first one I wanted to talk about was one of the biggest lessons that I took away from your class, of course, after graduating was just how much networking and community has power so especially after this past year where we might be a little out of practice what advice do you have for anyone that needs to practice that skill of networking and how to get out there and just talk to the people you need to talk to that's a great right. question 
Well, yeah, and you, you know from sitting in class that I'm all about networking. Um, but I, and, I, and I get frustrated because students are told you need to network, you need to network, you need to network. And it's kind of, you know, very much like a nagging mom. They stop listening after a while, but also there's never any, how do you network? So can, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I do in, in partnership with Joe Kaufman, who helps me with this, um, we have a, a conference that we, do, that we do every year called Spark South. Okay? And I force my students to go to it, right? Um, it's a, a, you tell students to network and they say, yeah, yeah. Right? You, right. I, yep. I, I tell them I said, networking is very much like sex. You can read about it in a book, you can watch a video even, but you don't really understand until you actually do it. Uh, and so I, I, I take them and, and put them in a situation where the marketing community comes together and they, uh, they spend an entire day sharing their knowledge with students. We have a mentor's lunch where the student will go and sit down and uh, have lunch with an industry professional. I say, you're guaranteed to come away with a friend someone that you can bounce ideas off of. Uh, and then, um, and they get to choose their tracks and they get to understand, kind of chart their own day based on the things that they're interested in learning about uh, from different, different folks in the community. Um, we get back into the classroom. I tell the students, now here's how you follow up. Because right? that one meeting is nothing. Just like putting an ad in front of someone once does nothing. You have to have a plan for how you're going to nurture the relationship over time. Um, and for students, if you're out of, out of practice, come to Spark South. Um, beyond that, shameless plug, um, you definitely need to intentionally reach out for people, even if it's a, hey, Shannon, I see that you work for a company that I'm interested in, I'm a student, would you mind networking with, or would you mind connecting with me on LinkedIn? First of all, no one says no to that question, especially if it's very humble, okay? You follow that up with, I saw something about your company in the news, made me think of you, hope all is well, or I saw that you guys did this work. I think it's great because, don't just blow fluff, give a specific reason, but you see how if you can touch that person four or five times before it's, hey, can I have a job? It's a much warmer situation when you start to ask for that job or I'm starting my job search. Here's a copy of my resume. Would you circulate this to your network? That's a good one. Don't do it first. Do it on your fifth call, you know, your fifth <laughs> touch point. You should have a plan, a touch point plan. And Spark South is an amazing program. I mean, the amount of content that y'all put together and the folks you get to attend, it's not just a shameless plug. I, it's really valuable for anybody who's able to attend that. So yeah, bravo sure. on the content. Yeah. yeah. I will say I loved it. I went twice. I know we only had to go once to get the credit, but I was like, I'm going again. And shout out to Joe, who was my coach. So, hey, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who also has a question. So let's just roll in that way. Okay. He says, when you are approached by companies wanting to hire your students, how do you decide which students to match with companies? So this one's difficult. Um, and this is why the competition, the coaches and all of the things are important. Um, I am at a place right now where I have 90 students per section, four sections each semester. I cannot know each student, how their soul, what motivate, you know, I, I can't know them at that level anymore, right? 50 students per section, two sections. Okay, I, 100 people, I can do it. We start getting the 300 a semester, and I'm a whole different, a whole yeah. different ball game. Uh, so I rely on the coaches who get to know them very, very well. Okay, if a student makes an effort to get to know me and wants to show me their work and treat me as a mentor, then I know who they are and I know how to recommend them. Right, but I cannot do it for every single student. So oftentimes, if you tell me you have a job opening available, um, I can post that job and the students can come back and you can, typically what I'll do is I'll say, okay, who are your top five, right? Once you've done that work and I'll, and then I can look at that list of five and I can tell you, well, this student did really great work for me in class. 
But as far as can you off the top of your head at any given moment recall any of the thousands of students over the last three years who would be good for any given role? I, my brain's not, I don't do it. Yeah. I'm not good at it. That's just the truth. Definitely. But the coaches do it. The coaches do it. The yeah. coaches do it very well. The coaches yep. mm -hmm. compete with each other uh, <laughs> to figure out, you know, who I can place where. It's there very much their puppet master of the world, right? That's They're, right. This one, this, the, you know, make these partnerships happen. And I, I do sell the students on the idea with the competition every single year. Um, that that coach will be a mentor for you, not just while you're trying to get your first job. They will call, you know, they will be available for you when you're trying to make your move to your second role after graduation. You will see them at industry events. They'll become your friend. They will introduce you to their friends. And so that relationship is a worthwhile relationship. And all it does Look, we all know a lot of the same people, but I can't be everywhere at once. And so finding those really, really committed uh, marketers who want to become those type of mentor, that, that just spreads the wealth. And I'm all about helping those people find a way to plug into uh, what we're doing. Yeah, I have a qu sure. quick question before, I, I, just while it's on my mind and sorry to interrupt. Oh, but I'm curious as to you talk about that and, and I and I immediately see a web. Do, do you have any examples of of how far reaching your program has gone? I know you talked about um, and I know I'm throwing you on the spot here, but you know you talked about students that have moved on and and as they should and and they're gonna live in San Francisco or Chicago or Miami or whatever. Can you provide an example of somebody that, that kind of comes to mind that's like, wow, they're like, you know, they're on their second or third ladder or rung up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they're killing it. Well, so, so I will say this as far as for, for outside of Atlanta, um, as a part of my uh, AMA work with the, with mm -hmm. the local student chapter, uh, I take those students to New York every year. And because there's a lot of students that want to come right out of Athens and want to go straight to straight to Manhattan and yep. become marketers in the city. Uh, and so I have many students who are up there and working and doing very, very well. And it's funny, once they, they go on that trip, they understand, oh, I do love New York. I do want to live here. I am going to make it happen. We tour around different companies. We do alumni dinners. We do all of these kind of things. They network their way in. They get their jobs. And then they're like, hey, Jen, I want them to come visit my company next year. And yes. they get right on that, that calendar and they start bringing, you know, dogs hire dogs. And it's very much a, um, a, a networking thing. Now, I do have students that have gone on that trip to New York, nurtured relationships and have gone on to work. One of them went to work in marketing financial services with Goldman Sachs. Another one went to Droga 5 agency side. Uh, a lot of them Arnold and they start media buying. So all kinds of different companies in New York. Um, but the students, they remember what they, just like everybody else, you remember when you needed it, you remember yep. who gave it to you and you can't wait to be on the other side of that and give back. The same thing, I have many students at Google, only one or two have gone to Apple, uh, but lots at Google and out West, we tend to tour around and see those. Um, had a student that went into marketing with the San Francisco 49ers, gave us a vaccines tour nice. of, of, you know, the stadium and all the things. And so it's very fun to see how all of it comes together. Um, yeah. I mean, I, how I, does I, that, I you, you have to walk around with goosebumps all the time. I mean, <laughs> just like the impact that you have made on so many people's lives is, is incredible. It's really cool. So I, anyway. I, I got to tell you, yeah. Marketing campaigns can get old, but seeing that fire in a student, seeing their light bulb come on or that fire get stoked and their passion, there is nothing better than that. And you're right, it never gets old. Yeah. Um, I, I always tell them my whole goal, my entire game is to set them up for success and ride their coattails the rest of my career. That's all I want to do. Excellent. <laughs> Love it. All right, Kay, sorry to take oh, over. Your turn. No, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, 
So the next one we have is from an anonymous attendee and they're asking, can you tell us a little about your thoughts on marketing and sales alignment as customer experience continues to be top of mind for many companies and how this plays into the course moving forward? It's a heavy one. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, uh, and this is something that um, that I think that, that that we don't do as well as we could slash should at Georgia yet. It will come, uh, but right now, um, with marketing students at Georgia, you have a choice. You can become a general marketer or you can go deep with the way that you choose your uh, electives and do the other programs um, to be a digital marketing student or you can be a professional selling student. And the way that you, because you only need 120 hours to graduate, you can't really become both. Hmm. And that's something that I think that we don't do particularly well because we teach professional selling as a discipline and then we teach digital marketing as a discipline. And honestly, the closest that I get, which is I own the digital side, I have a counterpart that owns the sales side and it's, it's more siloed than I wish it were. And I, I'm not, you know, George is a great school and I love everything about what we do here. I'm just trying to be real honest, right? We're a little more siloed than I wish we were. In my classes, what I do is I help students create that pitch right? So they have to think through all the things that would need to be in that digital pitch. And then I encourage them, totally optional for them, but I encourage them is there's a sales competition where they literally have to uh, do a, a, a pitch and it's videoed. So they get to watch their own mannerisms. They get to become aware um. of their speaking and it, it takes a whole lot of personal self-confidence to do this voluntarily. If you're yeah. a sales student, you have to do it to get the degree, but, but I encourage them to go do that sales competition because the things that I'm never going to be able to work with you on with your personal mannerisms and your vocabulary and the way that you, um, the way that you present information, you can get those skills that way. I don't, I don't have a, I don't 120 hours to graduate. I don't have a way to do be all things to all people. And so that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah. Does that I, answer the question? Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting though, because it's probably kind of more how it is in the real world. So maybe you're giving them the, the foot up the rear end to kind of take that initiative, which is what they're going to have to do in their career anyway. So I don't know. Maybe if you, it, yeah. if you start an agency there. sales, uh, you probably start creating pitch decks. Mm -hmm. Eventually you get invited to the meeting. Yeah. And, but eventually, and then finally you find yourself, you know, master of the, the conference room. Yep. Right. You know, you, you grow that way. So I, I do what I do, what I can and realize my limitations and what I can ask of students and, and go from there. Um, as far as like, as far as as far as consumer journey and 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 sales i'm very i'm very much about about digital return right mm -hmm. so we're not doing um i don't focus a lot on trying to come up with the value of a like or a share or a comment on a social channel, I look at return on ad spend and it's a whole lot easier to measure if you're selling blue jeans and shoes. And so I think I can, I can, I can teach it better that way. So, so from a selling perspective, it, it is, it's a lot about shoppable posts and things like that. And how do you get click throughs and what's your editorial plans for that and remarketing and that, uh, yeah, those things I do teach. So. Perfect. Okay. Uh, do yep. we have any other questions? We do have some, but I know we're coming up on time. Do we have room for one more? We've got, we've got time for one more. Okay, cool. Let's do it. So the last one that I see on here is, is there any specific trends or technology you're paying close attention to that you think will affect digital marketers? For example, dynamic content testing, ad automation, anything like that, and how will that, I guess, affect curriculum moving forward? Um, I start with literally A-B testing. And we're going to test everything. And again, I, I tried, I don't want to overwhelm students with, um, 
I, I tell, here's what I tell them. You as a digital native know how to drive software. I want to teach you concepts. I want to teach you things that will transfer regardless of which software you're using. Uh, and so then I go back to you should absolutely test everything, try it do more of what works, stop doing the things that aren't working, figure out before you test it how you're going to measure whether it's working or not. So I try to stay in very high level concepts like that um, with the idea that when they graduate and they move on, they're going to move into situations where, where they will apply those specific principles to any given, right, any given situation. You do one thing to understand is that my students, some of them go to work for agencies, some of them go to work for brands, some of them, um, some of them have very, very corporate, very, very tightly defined uh, roles and others go to large agencies or small where they get put into a department and they rotate around for a year. Others will go to a small agency where it's very much all hands on deck whoever works the hardest and figures it out first wins, go, you know, that kind of culture. And so trying to give students what they need, you know, I can't be as specific because they're all definitely going in different places uh, with where they're trying to go with their careers. Yeah, that's great advice. Can I do Paige? it one more? I totally yes. lied. No, <laughs> this do is it. a good one. Do it. <laughs> So from Lindsay, she's asking the relationship between UX and marketing has been prominent in my current position. Do you think that relationship is important for Gen Z students to learn? Straight up. <laughs> Mic drop moment. We're done. That's the end of the show. <laughs> Straight up. I'm going to start using Straight up. I like that. She went, she went Paula Abdul on you. <laughs> yes. So Lindsay, a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I can't, I gotta 100. say, I gotta say though, in the chat Q and A, I gotta say this because Catherine said, hi, mom, look at you. I just had oh, to say she's pretty, she's on her way to the lake. And so it's so awesome. I thought she, she was going to bail on me. Sorry. I didn't mean to, I, I'm just like, please, Kay, you can't go without letting her know. Oh. That yes, daughter is she is you on. It's very cute. She's your biggest fan. And, <laughs> and an incredible marketer herself. Yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, it, Apple does not fall far. As she will tell you, a dinner table conversation growing up, right? I think I always think that the dinner table conversation shapes who, who people become or kind of what they think about. And, um, you know, so if you grow up with, with a nurse for a mom mm -hmm. or, or a doctor for a mom, you have a whole different view on medical. Yeah. She grew up with a marketer for a mom. Yeah. My daughter just finished her freshman year of high school in a marketing program. Lots of really nerdy conversations. So, <laughs> yep. Very true. Fun, right? Yeah. My <laughs> kids just roll their <laughs> eyes. I'm like, would you, when, do you ever stop talking about marketing, dad? Like, uh, yeah, true. Now <laughs> I will. Anyway, Jen, this is uh, actually, I have one more thing because we always like to end and allow our guests to give shout outs or thank yous or books or podcasts or anything. This is open forum or anybody you just want to thank. Um, throw that out there and, and it's kind of your moment to just give back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I must take a few minutes to thank anyone and I'm going to, I'll try to name them. I'll probably screw it up, <laughs> but, um, but, but, the people who have helped me shape this program the most, okay? Um, Shannon Delaney, you definitely Aww. are one of them. Yeah. Patricia Camden, definitely oh, one of them. Love her. Joe Kaufman, um, <laughs> Teresa Camaro. <laughs> uh, let's see, who else are my, Alan McGee, um, Todd Koplovitz, uh, Adam Nade. Um, Brian Rudolph, oh. gosh, I should, I usually I have to do it on my fingers and I didn't keep up with it. <laughs> um, but anyone who has been uh, Scott Caperi. Oh, oh yeah. Can I telegraph some news? Please. 
How about that? That's better than naming everyone that I know. And I feel like I'm doing romper room, magic mirror. And if you're really old, you might remember that because I was like, <laughs> I two see when I was on TV. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but instead of doing romper room and thanking all of these people, um, I'll tell you what I would like to, to tell you. Scott Caperi yes. has accepted a role teaching marketing 4450 at University of Georgia. Oh, nice. nice. Start. Uh, so, so now we will have in fall, there will be two of us Wow! and I am super, super excited, um, about that for sure. Um, and I just saw the other day he had posted because he's, he's doing, is it wonder foods, I believe. And he yeah, just well, he, posted yeah, he, I call it the peanut butter company, but the yeah. peanut butter, <laughs> better, like, better than peanut butter. a case of that peanut butter, because there is a banana peanut butter and I'm like, yeah. wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm all over that. Scott, I'm coming after you here shortly. That what, was a we're, what we're hoping is that that will, uh, it'll do a couple of different things. Number one, it should allow my class sizes to get smaller. Mm -hmm. So that more personal interaction, Canna, that you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, is something we should be able to add in. Uh, but, but also um, I'll have someone to riff off of that can kind of help. So I'm not leaning on the community. Uh, yeah. Well, now yourself. that's the mic drop moment for the show right there. Yes. I mean, yeah. think that's a <laughs> perfect I'm way. I'm remembering, to... I didn't mention Derek Van Nostrand, Jason Prance. There's like yeah. <laughs> Rashidi Barnett. You're going to get Barnett. so many emails. Rashidi Barnett, like all the people. I know, they just keep coming. Yeah. They yeah. do. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I literally, as much fun as I have um, with the students, none of it is possible without these folks that, I mean, number one, they keep me from driving the program in a ditch. <laughs> right? They just help me stay the course, which is just so wonderful. But yeah, yeah. it's amazing. It's and, amazing. And actually, the last several years, my daughter Catherine has acted as co commissioner of the uh, digital marketing competition. So she actually keeps that, she makes that happen. I get to just show up, which is even awesome. More awesome. Good training. Good training. <laughs> well, this was, a, this was an amazing show. This was so much fun. I mean, I think you really showed the power of the Atlanta marketing community too, by naming all those names. And you're probably going to get a bunch of emails from people that you didn't mention, like Jen, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Be ready. Um, but we just want to thank you so, so, mm -hmm. so much for joining us today. It was such a fun way to kind of round out the season. Everybody that joined, thank you. We will put this episode up on YouTube. So anybody can listen again, you can share it with your network and, um, take a minute here at the end to just fill out the quick survey and let us know what you think about the show. If there's anything we need to improve and uh, Paul, uh, that's a wrap on season three. Can you believe it? And uh, uh, no. yeah, we're going to take a little break, um, but we'll be back before you know it. Um, so yeah, you know, yeah. exciting. Absolutely. And please stay tuned to our social channels, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, at speed bumps, live speed bumps, live, exclamation point. Make sure you put that in there on LinkedIn and you'll find us. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out. So please uh, stay engaged there. We're going to take a small break over the summer as everybody should. Um, and we're going to come back with some more amazing guests and conversations for a season four in the fall. So please stay tuned. And, yeah, and if you have any nominees, go to our site. That's right. We always please tell us, tell us who we should be talking to. So Jen, thank you so, so much. And we will definitely see you soon. Very good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank Have you. Have a great thank weekend, you. everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.